<laughs> if we uh, if we did that. So um, uh, we had to um, uh, adjust it. So anyway, here we are in the glorious day. Uh, when I looked at the weather yesterday, it said that there was a 40, 45% chance of rain uh, at 11 o'clock. And I said, oh, no, with my luck, it's going to pour. But, of course, Glenna's up there making sure that doesn't happen. So in this garden, her, her, her will rules, so uh, all things, including the weather. So um, I'm, I'm awestruck, uh, overwhelmed. Um, uh, never thought in the world that everybody who's here would be here. Um, uh, I, I have to just mention uh, the Chicago friends, uh, uh, Mary Helen Seinler, Jane K. Hill, Nancy Kelly, and Cookie, who drove. Oh, yeah. <laughs> by herself. <laughs> right, dro <laughs> drove by herself, a, a courageous person. So you inspire me and make, give, make, make the rest of us uh, feel like we can really move forward uh, and carry on. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, my, my brother Edson, who is, is recovering from shingles, uh, selected a, a prayer to start us off here. And um, so I, I guess I'm the celebrant <laughs> for this particular event. So it's, Father of all, we pray to you for those we love but see no longer. Grant Glenna peace. Let light perpetual shine upon her. And in your loving wisdom and almighty power work in her, the good purpose of your perfect will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, you can see I wrote a long eulogy and they're all going to say, oh no, he's not going to stand up and read that whole thing. <laughs> so you can, when, when you're looking for some light reading later on. So I'll just try to, to capture a few of the main points about, uh, that I wanted people to know uh, about Glenna. First thing, this is June 19th. Juneteenth, we now know, uh, because of, uh, in Texas, Laurel's here from Texas. And um, uh, the, uh, the general in charge of uh, the, that state um, let them know that slavery was over and he was going to use the Union Army to enforce it so they better get with the program. So uh, uh, now, it's, now it's a holiday and something to think about, which we didn't think. The only other notable thing on that particular day was uh, Trisha Nixon and Eddie Cox got married at the White House at the same time. Much to their chagrin, because we upstaged them. But uh, uh, so that was, that was, that was then. Um, we have a number of the people who were there. Uh, uh, Glenna's dearly beloved next door neighbor, Gail Hannon, was a bridesmaid. She graduated from high school and came to be in our wedding. <laughs> That's how young we were. And Holly was a bridesmaid. My brother Patrick was my best man. Uh, my brother Edson was an usher. So uh, we have uh, good representation from our wedding from all that time ago. So uh, we have, have uh, and many dear friends. I won't go through and introduce everyone from the town of Brewster, but, but lots of folks from, from there as well. Hopefully as we mingle over food, um, my goal was to buy out Dennis Public Market, which I thought I'd done, but when they got here with the delivery truck, they said they were delivering over 100 platters this morning. Oh my God. Uh, oh my so gosh. they started making up everybody's food at 3.30 this morning at DPM. So uh, uh, there's, uh, but anyway, we do, we do have lots of supplies. So the goal was to, to have things here that Glenna loved. And so sandwiches from DPM were always a, a good out. It's a, I call them cheater dinners. So if we needed a cheater dinner down to Dennis Public Market, there was always something good there. So that was that was number one. The other place that she adored was uh, 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 eat cake for breakfast. Danielle's wonderful patisserie here in the town of Brewster. And so we have a large selection of, of uh, 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 comestibles and delectables uh, for everybody to enjoy. And... Uh, uh, so it was a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful time. So um, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm just going to have to stop for one second because I have another honored guest here who is my cousin Emily, who just breezed in from Maine. So hi, Emily. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're wonderful. And uh, I can't remember who was older, you or Glenna, but I know you were one day apart on your birthday. So anyway, so so wonderful to have you here. So uh, once more, just. Uh, some of you may know I, I used to teach uh, public speaking at Northern Essex Community College. So the, the the function of that is you write the whole thing out and then you write point bullet points that you're going to hit, and and then speak extemporaneously. So 
Uh, I never got a chance to write the bullet points, so we'll just wing it here. And I did that a lot too in my academic career. So um, uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to focus on Glenna's incredible courage and then her love of beauty and the fact that she was such a beauty. Um, and Glenna, uh, from the time we were married, had great difficulty with social anxiety and panic attacks, and they really prevented her from being able to um, continue at college. She had, um, that's the uh, guitar mic, uh, she wasn't able to um, uh, go to Northeastern. She was, uh, was it enrolled in Northeastern, but the panic attacks took her out, and she just couldn't do it. And so we did other things with our lives at that time. Moved to Brewster in 1973. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my my old firefighting buddy Robbie Williams is here, and and when we bought that house, uh, it was serviced by Williams Oil, which was the preeminent oil company in the town. And so when we bought the house from the Lucy Chapman estate, we inherited Williams Oil along with that. So <laughs> wonderful to have such long support. And Kathy and Roger O'Day, uh, they did water babies with Laurel uh, <laughs> uh, over forty or oh, forty years ago. So. Um, uh, just such, such a wonderful thing. But anyway, uh, we moved to Brewster, and um, uh, Glenna just worked and worked and worked uh, on overcoming the panic attacks. And uh, her counselor, uh, Bill Sissel, is here also. And um, Bill uh, was worked with her to overcome this, and she was able to do that. And so some years later, she decided, darn it, I'm going to overcome this thing. And she went back to um, uh, Essex Agricultural Institute and um, earned her her uh, um, uh, associate's degree and that was huge and in the process of that she had met one other person and it just shows what what a difference one person can make in your life and so Glenna always tried to get the back seat next to the door in case she needed to get out <laughs> she never did but she always did that and um, uh, there was another woman who was trying to get this the seat next to the door <laughs> and she said to her you don't uh, by chance have panic issues and she said well <laughs> funny you should say that so anyway they became a team and if you have somebody to support support you like that you can get through tough stuff and she did and in her, earned her degree and we have quite a few pictures in that the Barbara Hersey arranged so nicely for us in the in the uh, um, I, I'm calling it the shrine the piano room uh, so do do take a, a look at those and then later on she decided that she wanted to earn a degree in uh, Bachelor of Library Science, and she, uh, her, her, one of her first jobs here in Brewster was at Brewster Ladies Library. So um, uh, uh, she developed a passion for for working in libraries at that time. So, doggone it, if she didn't power through that and to throw so many obstacles, she earned that degree, bachelor's degree, in uh, library science, and it just uh, one of my favorite axioms is is the world will bend to a committed will <laughs> and uh, the world bent to her committed will and so many other things like that um, family was enormously important to her and um, we'd sort of become disconnected from our Boochiever cousins and Glenna really really worked hard to to bridge that and to bring us all back together and it was just a wonderful thing to to be able to be reconnected like that and, and have that and it, it just once more, her, you, the world would bend to her committed will. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the other thing I, I would have to mention about Glenna in terms of eulogy is gardening and flowers and beautiful stuff. And and this yard, you know, I, I want to make this as fast as possible so people can just bask in the beauty of this yard. And of course, we have the the uh, added benefit of being surrounded by. Uh, all of this conservation land that's around us, the Hay property, which is Brewster Conservation Trust across the street, and then, of course, all the town land and whatnot, the, the composite reserves that are behind us. So it's just, just heaven. So when we found this house three years ago, it was just Glenna's perfect place, and she poured love into this garden. Uh, Mary Helen Seinler was just noting uh, the sea holly, which uh, when Mary Helen was visiting two years ago, uh, was just this little tiny plant, and it w Glenn was so frustrated with it, it wouldn't put up any blooms. Now the thing is huge. <laughs> it, it, it looks like a thistle. It's, I guess, a, a relative of the thistle family, but uh, uh, that's, that's Glenna's love just bursting <laughs> out there. Uh, so um, let me see if I have a, a bon mot at the end here. So. Mm. 
Uh, well, the, the other thing is being mom to three kids because she was just so incredibly proud of, of her kids. And I think the anecdote I use in there is because, because Glenna was such a voracious reader and such a committed bibliophile, uh, she um, would read to them every night. So, you know, whether it was The Lord of the Rings or Wind in the Willows or Secret Garden or, or, or The Little Princess, um, all of those things were read by Glenna to her kids. And so I'm sure that makes them the wonderful people they are today. So here's my closing thought. Uh, she had not let the anxiety beat her. Deep in, inside her, she had tremendous courage that she could summon the face of adversity. When I am feeling weak or fearful, or I need to summon, I summon some of her courage, and then I can do what I thought I could not do, which was a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, which she loved. God bless you, Glenna. Keep you, Glenna. I treasure your memory and your love. So thank you. So. All right. You could turn in your programs to the 23rd Psalm if you wish. Um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and lead it. I, I was trying to recruit people at the last minute to be readers, but there was just too much going on because I was the grounds crew, I was the, the house crew, and I was the, the garden crew, so it didn't leave a lot of time. Anyway, uh, Glenna loved this, and any time there was um, a, hard, a hardship, you know, uh, somebody died or there was something uh, very, really taxing because uh, she had been taught this by, by Hattie Hallett, Peter and, and Glenna's um, uh, grandmother. So uh, go ahead and do it because it was something she loved. So, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, one of the things that was a great blessing out of the, the, the medical miracles, uh, Glenna was diagnosed with stage 4 epidermal growth factor receptor lung cancer um, in, in 2017. Um, and you don't know how long you're going to have these miracle drugs arrest the cancer, but they can't get rid of it. And what happens is eventually the cancer mutates around the drug and, and continues. Uh, but we were able to get four wonderful years, and so we were able to go to all these different places, one of which was Vancouver Island Butchered Gardens, because Glenna loved gardens, and we visited beautiful gardens everywhere we went. So that was one of the gifts out of, out of, the, um, out of what happened. Um, so just, uh, Pat will be up next, but just another quick anecdote, which was um, um, I had the, the opportunity uh, Dana Farber and Brigham uh, encourage people to, if you're not able to be there when, you're, when your loved one passes away, they, they encourage you to talk to the attending physician. And uh, uh, Glenna was attended by uh, uh, Dr. Julia Roto, who's a Harvard faculty member, just a fabulous woman. Anyway, um, she said that, that Glenna even in spite of the fact that she was so sick and so ill on, on the morning that she died, that she was so gracious and all the staff loved her. Um, what took her life was a pulmonary embolism, and so that ended up being a mercy because she didn't have to go through a long, long disabling thing with cancer, and so that was a, a great mercy for her. But the fact that all these people loved her right to the end was, was remarkable. All right, now I have my, my brother Pat to, uh, to stand up here and take over for a second. Hello there, everybody. Some faces I recognize, some I don't. Some I should recognize, and uh, it's been so long, it's, it makes it really difficult. Um, but I am Charles Patrick Outwin, uh, Chris's younger brother and his best man at, uh, at their wedding, at Chris and Glenna's wedding. Um, I was given this uh, 
what is called a prose poem to read. Um, it's usually attributed to um, Henry Jackson Van Dyke, Jr. It's called uh, Gone from My Sight. It's also known as a parable of immortality. Now, Van Dyke first published it in 1904, but the uh, consensus now is that it was actually written by the Reverend Luther F. Beecher, a Baptist priest and the, uh, a younger relative of Harriet Beecher Stowe. So there's a great deal of, uh, of weight behind this particular imagery. I am standing on the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the moving breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud, just where the sea and sky come to mingle with one another. Then someone at my side says, there, she is gone. Gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight. That is all. She is just as large in mast, in hull, and in spar as she was when she left my side. And she is just as able to bear the load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not her. And just as the moment when someone says, there, she is gone, there are others' eyes watching for her coming. Another voice is ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. Thank you. Because of Glenna, because of Glenna, I be became able to fly on a plane without fear. <laughs> she introduced me to the change program, and God love her. I owe her so much gratitude. The best impossible little sister. Ooh, too high. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, I'm not going to be able. It's, it's always you put the opera star out and then you follow it up with a song. <laughs> So this is a song, um, uh, people that know us well know that my parents had a house in Nova Scotia for 30 years and, and one of our favorite performing groups up there were the Rankin family. Mm -hmm. and, and this song is by uh, a, a Nova Scotia songwriter named Leon Dubinsky uh, called Rise Again and every Rankin family concert was closed with this particular song. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to remember the words, I've only heard it a thousand times. <laughs> and. Um, When the waves roll out over the waters and the ocean cries, we look to our sons and daughters to explain our lives as if a child could tell us why. That as sure as the sunrise, sure as the sea, sure as the wind in the trees, we rise again in the faces of our children. We rise again in the voices of our song. We rise again in the waves out on the ocean. And then we rise again. goes dark with the forces of creation in a stormy sky. We look to reincarnation to explain our lives. As if a child could tell us why. That as sure as the sun rise, sure as the seas, sure as the wind in the trees, we rise again in the faces of our children. We rise again in the voices of our song. We rise again in the waves out on the ocean. And then we rise again. We rise again in the faces of our children. We rise again in the voices of our song. We rise again in the waves out on the ocean. And then we rise again. Woo! Oh, all right. Nice. Yeah. Little cloud cover, too. So nice, Ooh. Lana. Thank you. Came, sh came up short one reader. <laughs> so I'm going to read it. Let me shed my guitar here. <coughs> Henry Scott Holland, Death is Nothing at All. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I've only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I, and you are you. And the old life that we live so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we are still. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effort, without the ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I'm out of sight? I am but waiting for you for an interval somewhere near, just around the corner, 
all is well. Nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. I don't know, you want to, want to join in on this, Pat? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think I have it memorized. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you, you, can, you can... I'll you listen can, to you. You can... Well, it's in... Oh, that's right. It's yes, in the, it is. I yeah. see. There's the words right there, so um, okay. I'll just throw this into the middle. I'm expecting the three of us. So we, uh, Holly, Pat, and I, and Edson, we're all part of the Calvary Church, Episcopal Church <laughs> Choir in Summit, New Jersey for eons. So, Howard Vogel, God rest right, his soul. Howard Vogel with the organist and choir master. And um, so, anyway, we should be able to do a good rendition of this. It's Eternal Father Got Strong to Save, the British, the British Navy hymn, and, and uh, also largely used for, for um, uh, those. Oh, we got everybody in now. Yeah. Excellent. Yay! Yay. You need the words, Ed? I think I... I think we've all got I it. Think yeah. we've all, all right. <laughs> And you heard it at John McCain's okay. funeral. Oh, it's, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a good, good tune? A little higher. A little higher. Mm -hmm. we'll, take, we'll take your advice. You're the problem. <laughs> no, for me. <laughs> Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm has found the restless way, who makes the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to Thee for those in peril on the sea. To Nick and Doug for the antipathy. <laughs> antipathy. <laughs> so thank you yes. very much. Uh, I'm going to read a benediction, and then Nancy Kelly has some prepared remarks that she is going to read for us, and then then we're going to have Peter wind it up for us. That's uh, that's really not appropriate for. Uh, I guess a celebration of life it is appropriate for it. So. <laughs> Almighty Creator of the universe, the gracious inspiration for Glenna's gardens and her love of the sea. Accept her spirit and her physical essence into your eternal care and make her part of your never-ending creation and renewal. In the name of all that is holy and full of grace, may she dwell in the company of saints and angels forever. Amen. 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 Okay, Nancy. I like how the wind came up and the clouds came over and it's perfect. That's right, she's speaking. That's right. Man, is this running? I think so. Um, before I start the remarks, um, just as we were 10 minutes out of the house, I said to Bruce, oh, why didn't I take a picture of the heart uh, with the saying on it that, uh, can everybody hear me okay? That Glenna gave me about five years ago when we moved to our new place in Connecticut from Chicago. So I get online, I start looking at Google, you know, small ceramic heart with friendship uh, saying, and up it came. So uh, so I thought, you know, it was meant to be so. Okay, so I had this little heart. I put it on a tray on my counter. And every time we'd take a beach walk, we would pick up a stone that looked like a heart, and we would add to it. And that was five years ago, and I have a mound. And every once in a while, I'd take a picture and show it to, send it to Glenna because we couldn't see each other in the last year or so. Yeah. So I couldn't even, show, you know, usually I could show it in person when they'd come through. Um, so I'll read you what it said. It said... Life's truest happiness is found in the friendships we make along the way. So, my Chicago cohorts from yoga are here. They'll, they'll uh, recognize some of these stories. The first time I met Glenna, I was leaving my building in Chicago for a Wednesday morning yoga class that I had been taking for about 10 years. There was a base group of about eight of us, and others would come, float in and out of class, leave for a year or two and come back, but I think I pretty much knew everyone in that class. As I walked out of the lobby, I noticed another woman with a yoga mat in her arms and figured she was probably going to a class at one of the fancier Lincoln Park studios. 
However, as I started walking the four blocks to my less than fancy Old Town facility, which also doubled as a kid's karate space, the attractive woman with her mat seemed to be following me. When I turned around, she laughed and said, I'm not stalking you, I'm going to a yoga class. I said, I am too, at the Old Town Triangle. And she said, I am too, and that she was new to class and had just started. We started talking and never stopped. By the time we reached the door to class, we pretty much knew each other's life stories. Glenna brought such a great new energy into that class that it made us all extra motivated to not miss a Wednesday morning so we could hear her latest news. What new four books she had read that week. Her volunteer work at the park, the latest plans for their new house, and what her kids were up to. She also introduced us to an insider's view of the beauty and magic of Chris and Glenna's Cape Cod. We all made it a must to go, to, uh, to go after class to La Fournette, our local French bakery, to continue the conversations. Sometimes we sat for hours. We had to leave when we started, our butts started to hurt. But the huge tasty croissants sadly canceled out any benefit gained from any calories we might have burned during the yoga. And so began the yoga faction of her Chicago gang, as she called us. Good fortune brought us even closer after the Outwinds moved full-time back to the Cape and Bruce and I moved closer to my family in Connecticut. We had many four fun short road trips, or as we called them, meetups. Glenna and Chris would research the perfect place to meet between our two homes. Glenna would meticulously Google where to find the best grilled cheese for me. What restaurants would have a fireplace or a pretty view or something special to see? Sometimes we'd say a word and sometimes it would just be a day trip. They also hosted us on the Cape, treating us to delicious lobster rolls at the Sessuate Harbor Cafe. As Chicagoans, we realized we had never had a real lobster roll. And of course, Glenna made sure they had a grilled cheese for me. Must have killed her to see me eat a grilled cheese when that lobster was sitting there, but Bruce made up for it. We also enjoyed a delicious sunset dinner at the Fisherman's View after we walked their usual 50,000 steps that day, touring the beaches of Cape Cod. Glenna was always a little amazed at my lack of domestic skills. She was my mentor for cooking, sewing, and gardening. Okay, not the sewing, and not the gardening, or even the cooking. But she tried her best sharing recipes and her kitchen skills, but alas, we decided to leave the cooking to her. My favorite Glenna story, though, took place not that long ago. She always remembered my October birthday. Two years ago, she and Chris happened to be traveling through Connecticut that weekend, and she brought me a beautiful and treasured glass-blown pumpkin figurine from the Sandwich Glass Museum, along with, of course, local treats from the from Cape Cod. She knew how much I loved it, so last October 2020, when we hadn't seen each other and things were tough, she sent me a beautiful blue and white glass vase from the same museum, and she added some pretty orange silk flowers. I was so touched by her thoughtfulness that I quickly took a picture of it on my table next to the pumpkin and texted it to her with a thank you. She immediately wrote back with a note saying she was glad it arrived safely. But from the picture, she noted it would be best if I took a pair of standard scissors and snipped the bottom of the flower stem to balance the aesthetics. <laughs> Pure Glenna. We, we laughed together, we cried together. The day that Glenna walked into that class, joining Jane and Mary Helen and Becky and I and our beloved teacher Nancy, all our lives were changed. A phrase that comes to mind that sums up how we feel is, she left us better than she found us. We loved Glenna. We love you, Chris. Thank you for getting us here today all together to, to talk about how much we love her and we love you. And it's so wonderful to meet all the people I've heard about over the years. She loved you all and she loved this place. And she's here and here in the garden and with all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, other than maybe me, the person that knew one of the best is her brother, Peter. So, Peter King. Thank you, everybody, for coming from far and close to mourn Glenna's death and to celebrate her life. Um, Glenna was so beautiful, and that beauty reflected out into almost everything she did, whether in the garden or the table, the kitchen. Glenna and Chris had numerous houses that they um, found and... and, and uh, improved in great ways. The first one was in Brewster, I think. Isn't that right, Chris? Yes. Yeah. That was my first carpentry job. <laughs> I think there's a picture somewhere, but we tore the roof off the old barn. Yep. And I've uh, been swinging a hammer ever since, but, but not too much. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would like to thank Chris uh, for all the effort he put in to the last four years with Lana. He was tireless um, so many times up to Boston. He was just such a trooper as we tried to help Lana get through all this. And it was, um, we, we, we were kind of fooled because Lana just kept going on another year and another year. And, and she'd be going downhill and we'd get, Dr. Sands would have a new drug to try and she'd be back up and she went from not being able to go up and down, up and down the stairs to charging across the beach and whatever. <laughs> And when she finally did slip away, it was such a surprise. I was very surprised. It was a, um, it was a tough day. Um, I, I was the third in the family of three. Lindy was five years older than me, and Glenna was seven years older. So I don't have a lot of memories, um, you know, as a child. And when I, I guess I'll be 11 years old when Glenna went out of the house. But uh, later she came back to be very important in my life. She was a protector of me and my coach. She helped me with so many projects, things that I started with that uh, I wasn't pushing too hard and Glenna would come roaring through and, and get things going. She was, she was very instrumental in um, launching my tiny house career. She was a lot more excited about the little movie that was made about me than I was. And, and I remember um, she made a website and I was like, whatever. And uh, I didn't have a, a much skill with a computer at the time. So we had a system. Every time someone would contact the website, uh, Glenn and Chris would call me, get the phone number to me, and then I could talk to the customer. So that went on for a little while. But um, yeah, I, don't, I have more feelings than words right now. Um, I miss her very much. My, my first thought when I came to the door was, where's Glenna? I mean, it, it, I didn't even think, just, where's Glenna? Um, so thank, thank you very much for being here. Well, it wouldn't be an event for Glenna if there weren't things for everybody to take home. So as many of you know, um, and we've heard it referred to, Glenna was uh, a great beach walker, as was I, since I was her beach walking buddy. And um, I was trying to figure how many beach walks we might have taken in the years. And, and I mean, it, if uh, like, like Robbie and Elaine and everyone else who lives here in Brewster, um, you walk on the flats all the time. You know, if a, if a week went by and you weren't on the flats, it's unusual. So say we only walked on the beach 50 times a year. Well, it's 50 years, so <laughs> it's a big number. And Glenna was number one in a uh, inveterate collector of sea glass and shells and very, very good at it. You know, everyone else would walk past a, a piece of sea glass, but Glenna would see it no matter, you know, it'd just be this, this millimicron sticking out of the sand and still she'd see it. So she collected tons of sea glass. And um, after... Uh, uh, her loss, her departing this veil of tears. Um, I had all the sea glass and all of these shells, and when, as as I was conceiving of, of this get together, I thought this is a chance to take this because every piece of glass, every shell was touched by her hand and picked up with love by her. I can share all this love. So there's little glass jars that have sea glass and shells lovingly put together by me. So everybody's to take one of those away with them. If, I only have 34, I think, so if it gets beyond that, then you'll have to talk to me later, because <laughs> we still have some. So, uh, so there's that. So I wanted to have a few different things um, from her. Um, uh, for love of garden, um, my wonderful niece, Barbara Hersey, um, put together little packages of marigold uh, seeds. So take a package of marigold seeds home with you. They're on the, uh, all, both, both items are on the coffee table in front of the sofa. And then the, the last item is Glenna was a great bibliophile and lover of books, and one of her favorite books, frequently reread, re -read, was Gifts from the Sea by Anne Morrow Lindbergh. It's a short little book, but each, each item from the sea she writes a piece about. It's just a wonderful centering book. So. There's one of those, so make sure that you walk. If you don't already have three copies of Gifts from the Sea, then please take one with you uh, as, a, as a gift from Glenna. So you've got seeds, you've got seashells and glass, and you've got Gifts from the Sea from Glenna uh, when you're heading out. That brings the formal proceedings to a close. Um, 
And uh, once more, just, just a, the most heartfelt thanks possible to everybody for coming here. Bill. Glenna's pastor for so many years. Mm -hmm. You have, you're, you've got a thought to share, please? I will be brief. Oh, be brief. Okay. You can, well, everyone knows that you're a Methodist minister, so. <laughs> I tell people, never ask me a question unless you have an hour to wait for the answer. Uh, Everything that's been said uh, about and that you felt about Glenna, I share. Uh, I met Glenna and Chris when Chris had volunteered to give a concert uh, at the Methodist Church in Chatham when I was a pastor. And we had concerts on the lawn uh, on Sunday evening. And uh, she came for him to, he let her became a part of the choir, but she came when he was hers. And where was she sitting, Chris? In the right back corner by the door. Okay, alone, and I sat with her. And we became companions in many respects. And then, you know, uh, I was her, her counselor and then fortunately her friend. And uh, we, if you would know, she much preferred for her counseling sessions to be on the beach or in the open. And we were walking on the beach and she spied a scallop shell. Both hands still attached. She picked it up as would be her nature. Mm -hmm. She broke it in half and handed me half. The one that's on the memory table in the piano room is not the original one. I'm not giving that to anybody. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it became very s symbolic to the two of us and to all of you is that there we are not whole unless there's a matching half and she held on to her half of our friendship i held on to my half of our friendship and it lasted 40 years, Chris? Uh, it was 1975, 46. 19, 1975. And of course, it more and more began to envelop Chris. Uh, I gratified by your presence. I am uh, enthralled by her memory. Uh, we could get together for lunch and she would ask about the political atmosphere and then we had the one hour answer <laughs> uh, after that and we had in common so many things but we had in common my relationship first as counselor as pastor friend to Glenna and Chris and I'm delighted to share her with you, my memories of her with you, and uh, uh, I thought I was going to be late today because uh, as I think that everybody that's been on hold for a while decided to get in their car and drive, <laughs> and, and so it took a while to get through the get through the traffic because she was not very tolerant of anybody who was late. Uh -huh. So, sorry dear, I was not here at 11 o'clock. Uh -huh. Would you please forgive me? Thank you for letting me share. Okay, as a good Episcopalian, I'm going to go ahead and deliver the grace so we can go out and enjoy the food. So, 
Bless this food to our use and us to thy service. May we ever be mindful of the needs of others. Amen. 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 Let's eat. <laughs> Get out of the sun. You did a good job too. The reason is Burns has just captured so many things, so that's the point. Once you're writing the whole video with him. Yeah, yeah, and there's like the little, the little bits of humor slip into it, you know, once a humor is called. It's true, we're really different than ours in a lot of ways. I love that. She brought things to me. Well, it's the old opposites attract thing, you know.